This is the Amp Hour Podcast, released June 1st, 2021. Episode 544, sponsored by Mauser Electronics, standardizing manufacturing with Pete Staples. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Pete Staples of Blue Clover Devices. Hey Pete, how are you? I'm great. How are you? Great. I've heard you before on uh, on the Embedded FM podcast, and we wanted to talk a little bit more about manufacturing. Obviously, you do firmware stuff, but you do hardware stuff too, so good fit for, for both spots. What is Blue Clover? Blue Clover Devices is an ODM, so we produce electronics for various companies, Tesla, Puma, GM are some examples. We do it across industries. For a long time, the only connective thread we could think of was that they're all connected devices. So we refer to ourselves as the IoT ODM. More recently, we've started making some products under our own brand uh, that are B2B products that are sold to other factories or to clients who want to streamline test automation. Yeah. And how could you, how, how do you define ODM? ODM is a flavor of CM and uh, CMs are, are by definition making products for other people. ODM refers to its original design manufacturer and generally means you have some design capabilities in-house. So a lot of our clients take us up on doing board layout or firmware development or proto- prototype builds. And so because we have those capabilities on offer, uh, that's why we're an ODM and not a pure yeah. EMS company. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and I think that is important, especially because you're going to have more in-house knowledge of your own manufacturing process. That actually could be really beneficial to a client. But I wonder, I wonder about how like the type of person that comes to you from within like a Tesla or a Puma or a whoever or a Volkswagen or whoever's on your, your site as, as your customers, is it like non-EEs are coming to you and saying, hey, we want to just build this thing? Or is it like EEs within the company are coming to you and then they're saying, but also it'd be great if you help with blank? It's normally EEs, but it's busy EEs <laughs> that okay. may not have yeah. time yeah. to do it in-house. So nobody ever comes to us and says, uh, here's our product. We've been making it for five years and we need to do a cost down, mm, yeah. have at it. They always yeah. are coming to us with new products. And so the, they're not built yet. They're not designed yet. And they want to know that if the schedule crunch comes, that mm-hmm. <laughs> we can help out. And um, yeah. so it's usually folks with a little bit of risk in their project. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like too, I mean, if you're, if you're doing IOT stuff and you have this specialized knowledge around not just the hardware manufacturing, but also the testing, like we'll talk about and the firmware and the everything else to get a connected device out in the world, then, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of specialized knowledge in there that it might take a lot longer to learn internally at a, at a large company that they just aren't, aren't, uh, not qualified for, but they're not uh, authorized to do right. Their boss not, might not be well. Take six months and learn blue, every every aspect of Bluetooth, or you know, <laughs> right. So right, and uh, I, yeah, I think we we can go faster because of our experience, and particularly on the connectivity aspect, mm-hmm. you're you're reusing a lot. Yeah, you know, if if you've made electronic products but they haven't been connected, and then you're doing a connected one, it it would take that firm longer than it would take us. So it, it should be cheaper to work with someone like us. Yeah. And what, what are the timelines you're usually on? I mean, is it like a three month cycle or six months, 12 months, uh, 18 months because of the current part shortage crisis? <laughs> what, are you, <laughs> right. what are you guys usually seeing? Uh, well, as a new father, you can probably empathize <laughs> with the nine month uh, cycle. So <laughs> yeah. I think that's really the typical, but it can easily be more. Okay. And uh, being less than that normally means it's not a uh, full product. It's more like Uh, a board. So if somebody just needs a board that does something specific, so one of our clients is uh, they're doing a dev board with us, uh, Sci-5. 
So they mm-hmm. make a oh, chip. Yeah. Yeah. They need yeah. a board that you know exercises that chip, and uh, so that one was not nine months. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so then, how would you would you define a product being like a basically a sub assembly that might be going to this company, and they're able to like a saleable product? And that's the nine month mark of like fully tested, fully yeah. enclosed, per- perhaps, but like a it's just an, a sub assembly in their larger process. Well, if if it includes mechanicals. And there are just more suppliers involved and more ingredients, more different materials. That's that's what extends it. Mm. Tooling is something that can can really be a big wild card. And then if it's a simple enclosure, that's one type of tooling. If it's you know a mechanized product with multiple materials that all have to fit together, or you know, even if it's all plastic but just has a lot of parts. Yeah. Yep. I would not know how to do a printer, for example. That would be mm-hmm. like, wow, just yeah. so many, so many yeah. moving parts. Yep, yep, totally. Yeah, lots of lots of levels, lots of uh, sub assemblies on sub assemblies. Yeah. One thing that is uh, interesting about your your business that is uh, international as well, right? So you actually have facilities both stateside and in Asia. So what is what does your kind of offering look like in that way? Yeah, we started in LA, but very, very small there. So essentially, I I opened up a US entity in LA, and then was spending more and more of my time in in South China, so specifically Shenzhen. And we built up a design, a hardware design capability there. And design led to manufacturing and initially working with manufacturers and eventually opening our own factory and we continue to do our production uh, all in Shenzhen and we do most of the hardware design there and then we have an office in San Francisco that's where I am now and here we do uh, software development and some degree of hardware design and the teams work together in in one in one uh, cross-functional team uh, to bring the products to market and also develop our own products. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I mean, uh, so then what, what does it look like then? I mean, to to th- just start a, I mean, I, I guess because you're already over there, you're interacting with people, you're meeting people, you're making connections, and then having your own manufacturing facility, what is that process like to, to kind of bootstrap that up? Uh, I wouldn't recommend it to everybody. <laughs> we, we did it reluctantly, <laughs> so uh-huh, uh-huh. it was... You know, getting into manufacturing's actually not not so difficult. Getting out of it is is what's difficult. So uh, it's it's uh, you could just buy a machine and offer to make things, and you'll be a manufacturer. Uh-huh. We were forced to do it because we just couldn't get the efficiency we needed working with partners with our uh, particular quality standards and. I would say somewhat modest or dynamic volumes. So, mm, you know, yeah, if, you, if you've right. got, if you're Apple and everyone wants to make your stuff, but if you're a hardware startup with like needing a hundred thousand of something delivered for Christmas and then nothing for nine months <laughs> until, until next Christmas, <laughs> you're, you're basically there for all the pain, <laughs> you know, you're yeah, providing, yeah. Finding a lot of pain, but not much of a payoff for a manufacturer because it's so bursty, you know. Yeah. So we we just got worn thin uh, training up teams within other factories, and then you know having to move on after the build. And so it just made sense for us, uh, for and for our clients, for us to have our own factory. So we mm. we started out doing uh, screwdriver work, just tables and screwdrivers, and then we built up PCBA capability. And then there was an opportunity that took us into precision cables. So the two in-house specialties are PCBA and USB-C or lightning cables. So higher end cables. Yeah. 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 I mean, I I think of, you know, like sending out to Shenzhen just because there's so many cable opportunities out. There's so many people that are making cables, but I, I usually think about it for kind of the the simpler stuff, well, only be, only because that's what I'm doing, not because it's not possible to do other stuff. 
And so th- does that mean then that that kind of business, the PCBA, the continual PCBA and precision cables carries you through the burstiness? So if you're not developing just for one product, just for the Christmas time, it's it's yeah. the rest of the year? It, it helps. So if you can only do the the box build it tends to be even burstier whereas board jobs come up more more uh there's they're sprinkled more uh diversely throughout the calendar and so we also don't have nearly that type of uh, nine month cycle with a board like if someone has a completed has the board files and the build materials uh we can turn it around in, in a few weeks and uh, we don't have very high minimums for PCBA, whereas for uh, a complete product, if you're asking us to work through EVT, DVT, VVD, and get a golden sample and all that stuff, we have to have pretty high minimums just to make sure that uh, there's going to be some production to pay off all that energy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so does that mean then that you have like high, like variable clothes for workers too like you hire you know you hire people seasonally that sort of thing like does the, the workforce shift quite a bit yeah it does we we have workforce attrition and and also need to go out and need to bring in new people as things pick up we have a core of of workers who are pretty knowledgeable about our processes and so they kind of mentor the newer folks and typically when we bring in folks they start out as temporary workers and then become more long-term workers over time yeah that's cool i mean it's i don't think i've met anyone that actually is like running their own shop over there i mean obviously there's a lot of people i've met that and been on the show that have utilized cms that are over there but taking that step to actually set up a facility and maintain it i'm that's uh it's interesting because that really persists the, I'm sure that it's just a whole different set of challenges that, that you've experienced. Yeah. I, I remember taking classes in operations. So I, I did a, after engineering, I did an MBA and we had a class on ops and I just was like, yeah, if that's somebody else's problem. <laughs> I'm not going to have to worry about these things and, <laughs> you know, flows, units per hour and things like that, mm, yeah. that are, kind of simple calculations so you, it's easy to just kind of assume it's it's super easy but when it's your livelihood on the line it, <laughs> right when, it when you really... see your, your yield your <laughs> yield going down and your margins going down you're like oh wow okay this really matters <laughs> <laughs> where was that book <laughs> yeah. yeah right right yeah i i remember uh having a really painful run uh just like one one production run that was just really going sideways and i was flying back to the States and I picked up the Toyota way at the airport and i like was so glued to that book because, and I, if I'd picked it up earlier, I, I wouldn't have even been able, been able to read like 10 pages of it before falling asleep or something. But because I'd suffered these very issues, you know, just, just days earlier, it was a, it was an impactful book and uh, the Toyota yeah. way and Taiichi Ono and, what those folks figured out remain like pretty much how I believe manufacturing, like it really guides me today too. So with the Toyota, I mean, the TPS system, Toyota way, all that stuff, like, do you actually find yourself implementing that directly? I mean, how how much hands-on day-to-day operational stuff do you, do you have with, with the factory? Because it's just, it's pretty far away. I mean, you're in San Francisco, so a lot closer than I am from here, but still (laughs) not close. And probably not traveling that much during COVID either. Yeah. I haven't installed one of those double robots that like wheels through along the line <laughs> or anything oh, like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The creepy, <laughs> uh, floating head. Yeah. <laughs> no, frankly, right now, I mean, this is a pretty unusual situation to not be able to go there. So this was a test of our team and essentially our, our lieutenants have stepped mm-hmm. up and they're yeah. running it. So I'm in touch with them, but I, I really don't see what ex- exactly is on that line except through the, <laughs> through our tools. Through webcam. <laughs> yeah. And, and the tools we'll talk about here in a little bit, huh? Yeah. yeah. So you, you do have to be able to trust your, your partner over there or in our case, uh, trusting our, our own team to, to manage yeah. things. Yeah. 
it's it's a really demanding i mean manufacturing is it just takes so much energy it's and okay passion. you can say it sucks it sucks <laughs> a lot of times <laughs> <laughs> it can be, it can it's rewarding too though yeah because of course. uh you know we when we ship we take a we call it a container party so in mm. our slack channel we actually take a photo when we're loading up the container and uh we used to even like drink drink beer at at each container but that started to become a <laughs> who, productivity who this problem thing? <laughs> who packed this thing <laughs> we were joking because we also had those little confetti cannons and we were mm-hmm. wondering what our clients would think if they opened up the yeah. container it's the strangest packing confetti. material <laughs> <laughs> really ineffective but it's a nice color you know <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's uh you know it's physical so i guess that's one cool thing when you're when you're manufacturing is it it's it's shipped and you get to see it and you know pat it and know that a lot of people's <laughs> yeah. hard work came together into some physical good so yeah i've i've warmed to it but you got to know that you're in getting into something pretty <laughs> pretty right. challenging if you decide to open a factory yeah no doubt i mean what is what is your i mean i've heard this from different people but what is your personal take on like the threshold to taking stuff overseas. I mean, obviously I would think it'd be lower for, for working with blue clover. Obviously there's going to be, there's a lot more capabilities. It's a seam, more seamless transition, but what do, what do you usually advise people in terms of when to, when to go to China or Shenzhen specifically and, and really dig in and try and make it a, a broader, like in terms of numbers of units? Yeah. For like, for us, it's not, always unit quantity it's more about like how how much what the economics look like so if it's a high-end expensive product you don't need to make a million of them for it to be worth everyone's while in the supply chain Mm. so i guess our threshold is a million dollars a year Mm. that's kind of i think low in our industry not ridiculously low, but it's a lot lower than a large yeah. uh, Flex or a Jabel or Foxconn or someone like that would want to see. Below that, I think it makes sense to do it wherever, closer to wherever you are mm-hmm. and, you know, drive over and, you know, watch the line yourself and really see what kind of, what what impact your design is having and be give yourself the option to revise the design to make it more manufacturable. And then when, when you take it overseas, if you decide to do that, you'll be in better shape. So mm-hmm. we, we have a lot of clients that start out producing in the Bay Area, which is not, not, the, not a low-cost <laughs> manufacturing uh, <laughs> hub necessarily, but it yeah. works because you're really trying to learn about your product and learn how to make it. Hmm. I mean, and, and any, any plans to open uh, your own stuff stateside? I considered it. I remain open to it. I visited a lot of CMs in the Bay Area to try to understand where we might fit, like what it, what role could we play. And I was pretty impressed by what I saw. I actually felt like, wow, there are 25 of them like right here that pretty much know what they're doing what would what would i bring to the table and oh i see i did i didn't see enough of a hunger for capacity here to take that step here anyway so Mm -hmm. so far we haven't pursued that i guess if there was such a thing as a tabletop pcba line or i i've heard of things like that but nothing that really looked like it would do any of the jobs that we see but if that existed, that would make it a lot easier to bring something uh, mm. in just from a, like a, a space perspective or like a ease of use or just speed and speed and capability and mm. accuracy. And I mean, what I would love is you could print boards and you could populate them on a desktop and have mm. a little batch oven or something like that. And uh, I've talked to people who tried to set that up with uh what is it lp lpkf oh, there's a that's German. right yeah yep yeah yeah like the board routers that are and they're very advanced and well there's different levels they have right yeah yeah so i and i've visited uh nano dimension so they do the printing they mm-hmm. have a pc dragon the dragonfly right dragonfly yeah yeah 
but we sent boards there and to test it and they're like well you know we're kind of busy we may be able to get you a sample in a month or something and it, <laughs> yeah, i yeah. don't know it just I, I'm cheering them on. I don't, you know, want to throw stones, but it just didn't look like it could do anything that mm. we see in terms of an order, in terms of layer count, or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a pretty pretty mature process for getting many many layer PCBs, right? Well, at the time, actually, they they said, well, this board won't go through a reflow oven, and we're like, well, the, <laughs> that's the, <laughs> the next stop of the line. I that's mean, right, right. Yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I don't have my I don't have my soldering iron in hand to do that 324 pin BGA. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we, so far the the that real turn type of um, operate or small scale, we haven't seen anything we could use yet. Mm. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And I think that it is, a, it is a, some of it's just raw economics, right? I mean, that it's like what you're talking about. So it's interesting that it's, you know, you might bounce someone out to a, a local house until they're ready to, to move over to, you know, to your Shenzhen operation, that sort of thing. Uh, so I guess then your threshold must be a lot lower for the stuff you're building or, or just in general, right? You mean like our own products? Yeah. yeah I suppose sort of we, 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 uh, Give cut ourselves a break on yeah uh, right yeah I mean you can give up the margin because it's just like an operational thing right yeah mm. well let's talk a little bit about the things you're building because that is still related to manufacturing so you are now you've you've started making your own devices uh, they are related to ma manufacturing what what are the things that you're building so we have one flagship product it's called the production line tool or what we call it internally is the PLT. See what we did there, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, <laughs> how often do people start like singing like, uh, what is it? Uh, P no, not PLT. What's the what's the Michael Jackson song? PYT, like PYT, uh, pretty uh, young thing. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not hasn't come up. You, spontaneously you will now. Yet. You will now. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, next time I'll you're humming it on the line, the just yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, actually, McDonald's put out a PLT product in Canada about the same time we launched ours and we thought we were going to get in a tr trademark issue, but I think they, <laughs> they killed it off. It was a What's the impossible P? burger. It was oh, a plant, plant, plant oh, burger. Yep, yep. Yeah. Got it. So, but I, personally, yeah. I'm very excited about that stuff, but uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> trademark wise. That could be dangerous. Yeah. So far we think we're pretty much in the clear and it works. So we, we call it the PLT. We have a model called the PLT 200 that we, we launched around the time I was on Embedded mm -hmm. with Chris and Alicia. And this year we're launching a new version. It's called the 300. And the big change is that it's capable of programming Linux devices over USB. So the last one was really aimed at 32-bit MCUs like Nordic NRF52 or STM32, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. it did that fine, but we were seeing people putting Linux in all kinds of crazy things and like <laughs> lower, lower cost things than you, you could imagine. So we felt like we needed to up, upgrade to handle those kinds of products. And then we also addressed other feedback that we got from customers. Cool. So, well, let's talk about the, the 200 for people that didn't listen. I mean, we will link in the embedded art, uh, episode as well. So what is the PLT broadly? Like, what is the idea for it? Well, it's, it's a bridge. So for developers working on a product and the factory, there can be a really challenging handoff process, even just for the instructions of programming uh, their hardware. And so this is a box that standardizes the equipment you would need to program devices on a line and also test them. And so I guess the easiest way of thinking of it is what it includes. So it's a programmable power supply. So sometimes you would need a power supply on the line to power up the devices you're testing. We include that. Uh, it's also a souped up J-Link. So it can program the kinds of things that J-Link would do, but also now doing Linux class devices it's mm -hmm. a DMM, and then the fourth thing would be the, it's a Linux computer itself. And so that is what lets it securely connect to the cloud and push out the test reports. 
Yeah. So this basically, so if I was, I've got a new widget. I want to, let's just say the ABC board, the board that I'm building. I have that. I want to be able to program it. I could basically at the end of the manufacturing step, some someone's going to take it, put it onto a jig. This will allow me to not only see that it was programmed, but then also give me feedback on like voltages on test pads that might be on the bottom of the board, that sort of thing. And then yeah, also, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And then what are what other? I mean, what else are people looking to do with it? Is it like kind of UART harnesses or you know how how else are people like interacting with with the boards at the end of their lines? UART is a great example. So a lot of what you want to do is um, kind of tinker with your device. You know, sending a command, taking a measurement, send another command, take a measurement, and that's historically been really difficult to do. There have been companies that are more focused on the firmware side of things, and then there are other companies more focused on test automation. But it, we think that once you've actually got that device you know, right there at that magical moment, it's a great time to pretty much do everything you can to it and have a fully integrated test report for that specific unit. Mm-hmm. And so UART is, is a good one. CAN bus is another uh, little uh, feature that we add so, so that you can write commands that exercise the, the CAN bus, voltage, current, resistance measurements. There's a frequency counter. Everything we could think of that we were seeing from our projects is pretty much what we built into the spec sheet. Here on the Amp Hour, we favor sponsors who help our audience learn. Today, we're hearing again from Mauser Electronics, specifically from Paul Galata, who is a senior technology specialist. He'll be talking about predictive maintenance, which is a great real-world example combining past discussions around edge computing, artificial intelligence, and IoT. You might just have this machine or uh, production line that wretched itself and stopped. Now it becomes, where am I supposed to look? And one of the things that predictive maintenance helps us do is keep these uptimes longer, but by also having sensors and IoT and artificial intelligence incorporated, what we can do is even if something does break, we might go, there it is, exactly right in this location. That's Uh where it went awry. That's what I need to go in and address. What do I have to do to go address that? Sometimes it is, you know, turn a screwdriver, you know, flick a switch, you know, whatever, and things get rolling again. In other cases, you have to go back and look and go, nope, there's several other factors that have caused this to, you know, break down in in this area. And it's hoped for that what you can do through the predictive maintenance is address any and all of these various things that might build into constituting a problem. Yeah, we had one past guest who was doing uh, remote sensing of the current going into a fan Mm -hmm. that cooled down a stamping machine in auto plants. And it was because the cost of downtime was so high that the automakers were willing to pay pretty much anything for it. And it was like, so how, how does how does cost of downtime? Play? You know, there there's so much uh, complexity going on when you, we're producing something with such tight tolerances and and uh, high frequencies and and those type of things of what we're doing. That what we want to do is to be able to operate efficiency. And you can imagine that when a business is shut down, just like when my internet is turned off, just think what that does to me. I asked Paul to give another example, and he gave one that I think many listeners have experienced and will therefore understand. I'm not that handy with my car, but I do know that I'm supposed to go in every few thousand miles or 10,000 kilometers of driving and change the oil. I do that in order to keep the car running longer. I don't know anything per se is going to break, but I do know that if I don't keep regularly changing the oil and going in and making that, that ultimately I'm going to have a very, very expensive break because good lubrication is essential to keep things running. And so in the same way, we go in and we set up, whether it's something like a frequency or certain conditions are met or things exceed a certain boundary condition that design engineers have put together to say, hey, now's the time to step in and do that. So we can use more information than just something like I do uh, with my car, where I say every three three months or, you know, so many kilometers of travel change. As in any of these discussions, I was curious about real world examples and where we can expect to see this technology put into action. 
I think the largest three industries that are going to use predictive maintenance are industrial, factories, lines, operations, and the homes and that type of thing. Smart homes and, and smart buildings, industrial offices, those type of things. And then finally in the automotive section, which is just becoming all about electronics. Explosive growth there where the car becomes more intelligent as we give it its ability to drive. And uh, since its surroundings, it's also going to get more and more intelligent about what it needs to keep itself operating. To learn more about how this might impact industries you're working in and how predictive maintenance will save your users money, check out theamphour.com slash predictive. And that'll take you to the Mauser page about the topic. Once again, that's theamphour.com slash predictive to learn more. And now back to the show. And then, I mean, so you mentioned that it was hard because of these kind of disparate tools that are out there. What, what made it hard about that? Like what wasn't, what wasn't connecting at the end of the day? Like what was an example of like, you'd be running an old service, you'd maybe program it, but it couldn't do other things. Is that the idea? Well, at the the larger established CMs, they're very uh, lab view based. So they typically say, if you want to do test automation here at our factory, you got to write down everything you want tested, and we're going to give it to a specialist who's going to build a GUI on lab view and build all this stuff that does that test. But then there's only that one place that can run it because mm. it's They've got the license, they've got the hardware configured for it. It's all very specific to that location. And we've talked to a lot of people who ran into that and they just, the only way to really figure out was what was going on in reality on the line was to go there and often it wasn't oh, very close by. Got it. So you so then you start talking about maybe being able to like mirror a setup on your bench in the States and then also have one at the end of the line and have have like a very similar setup? Is that is that kind of the thinking there? Yeah, it's to standardize the, the hardware and the OS so that the, the only thing that the engineer working on the project has to spend a lot of time on is the test plan itself. So he's just writing, he or she is just writing this uh, test plan, which is a script that can be sent to all the PLTs wherever they may be. And they're going to get the same result because it's running on the same hardware and Got the it. same uh, operating system. So now the test plan is also like a revision controlled kind of thing. And then you could do like a release and say, oh, we're moving from 1.15 to 1.16. And here's the here's the change notes, yeah. that sort of thing. Exactly. It, I mean, the release pattern is we, we pretty we really embrace uh, CI, CD and people de who are developing in GitHub, which more people seem to be doing firmware in that environment. And so once a new version of firmware can be released, that would be also an opportunity to release a new test plan, maybe a new label configuration file. So these things get packed up into a release and that's the mechanism for deploying out to PLTs. Mm, okay. And you can you can have different deployment groups so you could have one for staging and then you could have one that's right on the line you could have identical lines at different factories but then you could update them all simultaneously hmm okay yeah that's a really interesting point too so it seems like the the lab view methodology it seems kind of heavy handed honestly like because it's like you could add so many things to it right so much specialized equipment like Pixie and, you know, talking through GPIB to a wide range of tools. It seems like this is kind of like a scaled back version because maybe you don't need as much specialization, but also that allows you to broaden the scope of like what you can talk to and get more volume in terms of the number of testers out there. Is that a fair characterization? Yeah, I think that's, that's really fair. I mean, and I did an amazing, at, at the time they launched that, it was a huge breakthrough and they have... I'm sure they can beat us on certain technical points on, on their test equipment, but a lot of people really just need DMM type functionality. They just need yeah. to be able to be sure it's really happening on every single unit. And that's what we've tried to make cost effective. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting because it's like, I would imagine a lot of the IOT type of devices that are out there too, unless they have some specialized input device. So like if you're using like a pressure sensor or something like that, you might want to have a pressure chamber that's tied to it. And I would imagine that sort of thing 
would require, you know, if you wanted to do a functional test like that, where you actually take the pressure all the way up and all the way down, or you're doing a calibration, that sort of thing, that might be out of the scope of the PLT. But if you're assuming, if you're getting a sensor from a manufacturer and it's already guaranteed to a spec, and then it's talking over I squared C, you might not be doing that functional test. You might be just sampling on on the actual yeah. uh, output of or input to the pressure side of things. Yeah, that's a good point. And and we named it production line tool. We didn't we didn't do a focus group or anything on it. We just kind of came <laughs> up with that. But it it does emphasize the point that this is not really built for design validation. So you wouldn't mm. see it at a SGS lab necessarily for a thermal vac or shake and bake tests and things like that. It it you could, but it's not really made made for that. It's made to be for validating what you want to test on the line and then very quickly but precisely getting that going on a line and being having that live feedback so that yeah, yeah. you know you know it really happened you can get you can get the updates in slack even right yeah so that's what i was wondering about so reporting back to to home base like what does that look like is it just like an mqtt kind of thing or is there like a database that's tying into like how does it how does it actually let you know you know, unit one, two, three, four, five just went through the line. It's out of spec. It didn't talk on, you know, test four, seven and 25 didn't pass that sort of thing. Like how does that get, how does that get tied all the way back, especially for a PLT that might be in Shenzhen when you're sitting in San Francisco? All the PLTs are connected to PLT cloud. So it's a cloud native device. And so as, as it's running, it's sending each report back to the, the cloud backend that we built up. We do that because we have to ensure there's a secure connection. People are putting their firmware through this pipe. So it's got to be, you have to make sure there's not an opportunity for a man in the middle attack to be like, oh, that's the firmware. Well, let's just give it the same name and put our little firmware in every <laughs> device or something yes, like that. Right, so right. we have to sign off on the security of that connection once it's in PLT Cloud, there's a portal. So from a web browser, you can see, you, you would just click on reports, and then you would see the list of reports one by one on each unit. And those can also be exported. So we have a feature called Report Connector, which allows you to set up to dump those into something like an S3 bucket or some other database so that if you have your own data lake or your own archiving of all these reports. We're not trying to make it hard to get those or anything. We, we, we actually recommend exporting that if you have some destination like that set up. Yeah. And then the Slack app is just a, an app that we built that you could install on your Slack instance. And then it would show the pass fail on the overall unit. So the, the total test report end result. And if you click on it, then you could see the detailed report that would show you which test failed. Yeah, that's awesome. What does the actual interface look like? I mean, so is it just like a generic, like what does the physical connection look like? Does there some kind of like connection header that goes out to a bed of nails wire harness? Is that sort of the, the standard? Yeah. The ICT is the kind of easiest to understand arrangement. So we ended up building our own ICT fixtures too, to just kind of convey more clearly what, what you might use this for. It doesn't have to be for PCBA testing, but that's the most popular use case. Mm -hmm. And so um, on our shop, we also provide a ICT chassis, which is just a, a fixed a thing to hold these um, pogo pin cassettes as we call them. So the cassettes are what engage with the, the board and then mm. there's a connector on every cassette uh, that, and a standard cable between all of the, <laughs> any any cassette and our PLT. Do I do I spy a DB9 or DB25 rather, or something something more? There's a HD78. Mm. That was interesting. Oh, it's we even just, more. Okay. Yeah, I, <laughs> we, it looked like a DB25, but now there's three rows. I see. Yeah. Yeah, we. Uh, we didn't want to design our own connector. That was, that was for sure. And mm -hmm. uh, this was the largest, I mean, the most pins 
we could find in a fairly rugged connector. I actually later found out Garmin uses this connector in mm. their uh, glass cockpit product. So there's at least one other user out there. It's not <laughs> DB, these uh, uh, D sub connectors are not exactly uh, flying off the shelves, but they, st- <laughs> they still make them, and uh, it was a good fit for us. You know, in 2021, uh, the the measure of success is just how few other people are using it, not not how many people are using it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's us, us and Garmin, as far as I know, and okay. the reason for that connector is you've got a lot of test points on your board potentially, and we wanted to provide as many, cover as many as we could. So we still have to use MUXs, but we can support, I think it's 48 digital test points and 45 analog test points. And that's because we picked a really big connector. And beyond that, if you had, if you came to us and said, well, I've got a hundred test points on my board, any kind of Outside of the PLT specs scenarios like that, we we can address with the cassette. So the cassette is always custom anyway. And if people need to test like a GPS signal or LoRa or you know something that's just not standard in the PLT, then we can design that into a cassette for some engineering charge. Got it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And then uh, that actually brings up another thing that this is reusable as well. So like the PLT would be able to swap between as you update your line or as you change your product or whatever, you the cassette would probably car- carry along with the rev that the board of being made, right? Yeah, y- you you can reuse the cassette. The cassettes themselves have IDs and everything. So we kind of envision that being a library we we called it cassette because we're like, yeah, you know, we should bring back cassettes. Nobody has, uh, <laughs> nobody's making cassettes anymore. It's a cool yeah, word. Yeah, right, right. It's right, ready, ready to come back. Yeah, we talked about it in the show the other week, actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard that. So, and, and we had a, a French guy working with us uh, at the time that, that was like, yes, it is a cassette. That is that is what it is. <laughs> and, like, and so it shall be. So yeah. Uh, yeah. Can't can't fight the can't fight reality, you know. <laughs> so so we kind of picture that, you know. Honestly, nobody's got like shelves and shelves of li- uh, a full library of cassettes, but you could because they're the same size and and they're mm-hmm. removable, and that's a lot better than what a lot of people do have, which are cemeteries of ICT fixtures wrapped in plastic wrap taking up like tons and tons of shelves and you know getting one of those back up and running is a real right. crapshoot you know and uh ours we, because it's a more i would say more engineered it it you 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 kind of know what to expect you you put it in the chassis you connect the standard cables and then you run the test plan that you ran last time and you're yeah. going to get the yeah. same result yeah i mean one thing that I think we talked about, but also does pop out as you look at this sort of the system and setup is I'm sure that there's many engineers listening being like, Oh, well, and they're bristling and they're like, I've, I've done this. I've, I've standardized and I've done this. And it's like, yeah, but I bet you weren't allowed to take it from company to company. And so some of it is <laughs> just having a third party, like, like blue clover doing this. It's just kind of nice to have, you know, okay. So yeah, the IP, maybe you don't own the full IP and it's not completely custom. You don't control everything about it. And yes, there's cost involved, but it's like just having any standard. I feel like in the in the out in the world, uh, or any system out in the world, it allows some level of standardization. So if I go to a company A, and I design a completely custom ICT, I could not go. I'd have to go and re-engineer that at company B. You know, like I just I can't bring my design files with me, even if it's mm-hmm. you know a completely similar kind of design that I'm testing at the end of the day. So having something like this allows you to basically interoperably switch between companies and use kind of kind of similar things as well, which is nice. Yeah. A lot of people have made PLTs for sure. And uh but it's two thousand dollars. I mean it's not it it's not anywhere near the cost of Right. You know, engineering something like that yourself. Right, right. Yeah. Like two thousand dollars or ten man hours, right? You know, like yeah. There you go. Yeah. And yeah. and really these test fixtures are typically I mean, at least 
our experience in Shenzhen is they get made in Shenzhen uh, nine times out of 10. It's like a local, it's a small shop that comes over, looks at your board and takes one back and, you know, tinkers with their CNC machine for a while and has oh, yeah. okay. like analog dials and, you know, these things come back and they put in, they like hot glue some buttons on it and stuff. Mm-hmm. And red light, green light. You need that too. Don't forget that. You know. <laughs> Oh, we have that on the new model. I mean, you got to have it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so it's it's just not replicable, you know, like that mm-hmm. person just has a stock of certain hardware in their in their shop. Sure. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you're going to get different results if someone else tries to make that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or even that person tries to make it a year later. I right? guess that, that could end up being, being very different. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so uh, looking at the device itself, I mean, I've, I've got the web page up here. There's basically an access port in the back, but it does say as well that there's like a hardened Linux computer internally. So like, what is, what's going on internal to the box as well? Well, we use Linux to run the, the display. It doesn't have a keyboard that's intentional. We didn't really mm-hmm. want it to feel like a computer and have all the, I guess, things that could go wrong. We wanted the operator's user interface to be highly simplified with a small number of buttons that's Mm, essentially loading a test uh, and executing a test and aborting a test, you know, not, not, oh, here's a command line. What would you like to do today or something (laughs) like that? Yeah, yeah. So it's almost more like a, like a 3D printer display where it's like you can pop in, there's not an SD card in this case, but it's like you basically, you have the choice of whatever's been loaded on there and then you can run that thing that's on there versus yeah. designing the thing that you're putting onto that 3D printer, or in this case, a box. Yeah, box. it's not meant to like develop a test plan, for example. It's really mm-hmm. meant to, uh, to, to run it. And then, you know, we have to connect to the cloud. So you don't really want to be building that on... On, on nothing, you, you, we, we just use a, a, the Linux kernel and build on top of that so that mm-hmm. we can have the, we have a secure element inside of the unit and there's something that I, I normally refer to as dual certificate pinning. So essentially the, the cloud is looking for the specific unit and this unit is looking to a particular location in the cloud and mm. you know that's always got to be resolved so that this critical data can be exchanged securely. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so then does that also enable like provisioning of devices that are out in the field too? So like if I'm making a Wi-Fi device and I want to use a PLT to program it, but I want to give that Wi-Fi device a, like an AWS certificate, does that secure connection enable that sort of thing? Yeah. It's not automatic. We do have a feature called webhooks so that you could go get ser- serial numbers out of your own mm. cloud backend oh, nice. and put those yeah. in. It's starting to come up more and more, this need to put tokens in each unit. So anything that's yeah. just going to be on some secure network, it may need to have a, a special identifier. This is a good thing to build on top of to implement those things, but some of those uh, token servers are kind of specific. And so I won't just say, oh yeah, it works out of the box. Like there may be some, <laughs> right. there may be something that has to be built, but that secure connection exists. So it's a really good mechanism for doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Hmm. So like you mentioned that this, there has like a secure element internally. Is it the idea like, so say someone like a disgruntled employee, like walked off the line and they're like, I'm taking this with me. And they take that box and they try and use it somewhere else. Is that kind of the idea that you can basically like deactivate different elements remotely, yeah. different uh, boxes remotely? Yeah. A, a box is enrolled to an org. And mm-hmm. so if somebody else w- got it, they couldn't do anything with it. I, I guess actually that's not quite the case. So they couldn't do what that org was doing with it because uh, okay. they'd yeah. be locked out of it, but you could re-enroll it into a new org. Hmm. So they, they can be reprovisioned, but they are assigned to a, an org and, you know, can't see test plans from other orgs and, uh, and things yeah. like that. Yeah. That's interesting too. Yes. I mean, cause this is going into, I mean, a CM might not, might have four different companies that are using 
that CM. Usually the lines will be separate, but things wires could get crossed, whatever. And so I'd imagine making sure that only, you know, when board from company A is on text on PLT for company A with using firmware from company A that like you want to make sure all those things lined up and not just for a security basis, but also that you're putting the right firmware on the right device, that sort of thing. Yeah, the the model so far has been more that the brand holder buys the PLT and sends it to the CM and then oh, they, okay. they just run it. But it'll be interesting to see over time whether the CMs just say, okay, we have a PLT, it's uh, provisioned, yeah. it's enrolled in our org, so you need to, you know, send us the test plans and so on through our instance or, oh, you know, or whether they'll get reprovisioned more often, something like that could happen, but we don't, we just make sure that, uh, if you buy it, you control what's on it and you control, uh, what it can do and that, you know, nobody else can use it with their own test plans and things like that. There are different permission levels, but Every org has uh, one specific owner. Okay. And then, I mean, so a lot of times this is in China. I've heard about, you know, connecting and, you know, getting data back from factories over the Great Firewall can be kind of tough. I mean, is it does it kind of make that more seamless to get data back out? Is that something that this enables? It definitely seems to. It's in a, so it, a, a lot of the PLTs are used in China. We haven't had any issue of, the server it's talking to being blocked and then, you know, not, not being able to work properly. Right. If the more common problem we've heard of is simply the reliability of the network. So if, uh, if they say like, Oh, our connection is, you know, acting up, we just can't, we don't have internet. Well, we're like, well, it's not going to work without internet. So <laughs> yeah, right. That is part and parcel of this product line. <laughs> Luckily, it's not working on Wi-Fi. It's a Ethernet cable, so you do just plug it in, and then if you mm-hmm. if your entity has internet, then it's going to work. So far, it's been proving itself to be the case. Mm. If the internet connection itself is flaky, what we recommend are uh, cellular modems. There's yeah. not a ton of data. It's not like a live video it's feed. Not streaming, so, yeah, right. <laughs> so it's fairly. And we do that at trade shows too. We'll just take our own modem and connect it up and use it that way. And it, that's that's been pretty effective too. Okay, that's cool. So what are the, so you keep mentioning test plans. What do those look like? I mean, is it like a Python script? Is it like some kind of internal scripting language? How, so if, I, if I'm starting, so if I'm writing a test plan for the ABC board, what does that actually look like on my computer, on the PLT, on the PLT cloud, everywhere? Like where does, what does that look like? It's a YAML test script. So uh, it's a YAML <laughs> file. YAML runs with YAML. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, happy coincidence there. Uh, mm-hmm, so it's yep. we, we pick that because you can add comments to it. It's just a simple deterministic file. But unlike JSON, you can add what that test is about. So normally, you're just listing tests 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then each test may have one or more steps. So you'll have test one and then step 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. And those steps tend to be like uh, connecting up to test points. So you might be establishing which signal you're looking at. Is this an analog test point? Is this a digital test point? And, And you have to configure the routing back to the PLT so that you can take the measurement that you want to. And then you may measure that there's a command called measure and that may be measuring voltage, maybe measuring current, and you're just identifying which locations on the board you want to take that type of measurement. Programming is just program and then the file name of the firmware image and what type of target. So you might say program NRF52 and then the name of your hex file. So it's fairly fast to learn, but every every line matters, so it's not trivial. Right, to, right. It doesn't write itself. I mean, you you do have to know your product in order to write the test plan. 
Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at the docs.pltcloud.com and the test plan reference. So this does have a bunch of the, the things on there, but you're saying like the connection type stuff that, so that is like internal to the PLT. It's translating that command into basically like a control of the mux. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So it, it, the, the report then is just a regurgitation of that test plan and except with the result. And, mm -hmm. uh, that makes it, you know, fairly predictable. <laughs> you mm -hmm. you yeah. know what you're looking for. When we make a cassette, there also has to be a little bit of a conversation, which we call the test point matrix. Mm -hmm. So that matrix identifies what the meaning of those test points are. We don't have a AI way of doing that. <laughs> um, you pretty, you pretty like much have to tell us. <laughs> <laughs> Like it, they have to be identified whether they're analog or digital and ground or VCC or whatever. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, that's like a, like a pin, like a pin table for a microcontroller as well. Right. It's like, yeah, you might be talking just to like that. port, you know, port one pin seven or whatever, but it's actually pin 45 on your BGA or something like that. So yeah, that makes mm -hmm. sense. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, looking at the, this is actually really some of these basic examples you have on here too are it actually looks super clean. I mean, like the actual versioning and just the the steps that it's doing, it it doesn't, uh, like the command is like identify NRF52. That's okay. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that's uh thanks to our dev team. I mean, they're just, they're really good. And, uh, you know, this was born out of their frustrations and their, uh, years and years of experience. And, mm. you know, this thing just, came to life it wasn't it wasn't like we went out and did a survey of what what's the market asking for nobody yeah, was right, really right. asking it was just uh we kept doing projects and we kept building things as needed and finally there was a project that just had so many tests there was just no other way other than <laughs> take uh, this anymore. automating it <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 this is great yeah it's a, a scratch your own itch kind of project huh and we didn't talk about the scanner or label printer, but you can also mm. plug in that directly. So uh, that makes it very manufacturing friendly. So that that a plug that plugs into the like that's something that would plug into the actual back of the PLT. Is that the idea? Yeah, yeah, just in the USB ports, and that's okay. something uh, Jan um, from Partsbox and I talked about because he he was like, we do so many things, but the one thing we can't do is just drive a scanner drive a yeah, label yeah. printer because the web, it's in the web browser. based stuff huh yeah 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 so uh that's that's one thing that this offers is you can just plug yeah we have to check it so uh we don't work with every single scanner and every single printer but the four of each or so that we've tested against that's all you do is plug it in and mm. those are also things you can put in the test plan like scan mm. or print that's nice. Yeah. And that's, I mean, so that's, is that because this is operating at a lower level, like, like, like basically script code that's running on top of the OS, that sort of thing versus like in a web, web context, like Leon was talking about? Yeah, I think, I mean, his limitation was that it, it can't, he can only process so much from a browser and uh, like the, the printing function is very, I think he said it, it can only print what's on the screen. You can't say mm. print this file, for example, but we can um, allow, part of the release can be a, a .zpl file, a zebra, zebra label format. And you can put that in and it can say print, pass and then serial number and then insert the field for the serial number and uh mm. that can just be part of the test plan that's nice normally normally that's done if everything passes and then if it fails some test you have a different label that says you know sorry try again and <laughs> <laughs> broken yeah put this in the scrap pile uh, have the tech look at it please fix <laughs> yeah and as a as an old line manager that's a huge relief to just have automated labels about what tests failed because uh, I'm so used to reading, trying to decipher handwritten things on masking <laughs> tape that's, <laughs> that yeah. say like no lights or, you know, it's yeah, just something yeah. like Do really doesn't big. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is Buhal. Yeah, this is no good. <laughs> yeah. 
Yep. Oh man, that's yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, and is that the zebra stuff? Is that the like the acid proof, like the that uh, polymer based labeling system as well? I've I've heard about those. I've, I've never really used. Them. I, I I'm used to like I have an old brother label printer here. You know, it's paper hmm. paper based with adhesives, but I've I've heard about the ones that are like like chemically safe as well. I'm not the expert on it, but the the paper, you know, the materials themselves have a million flavors. And mm, so yeah, you can yeah. go, it's a big spectrum. And Zebra, you know, they've done all these acquisitions. It used to be Symbol and then like Motorola. And <laughs> now like all the scanners and printers are all under one roof. Mm. And uh, so far we're, we're kind of happy just working with Zebra. I know they're not yeah. the cheapest but they do have a big range of models. So the, the scanners typically aren't that expensive. The printers are, are a little pricey, but they're a lot cheaper than proving this works on that's another right. printer. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, I mean, like, no, I think that's actually a good topic to talk about as well. Like all of these things, I mean, these are industrial level prices, right? I mean, this is like two grand for a thing is not cheap, right? That I'm not going to probably buy this from my bench here. However, you know, if my client, one of my clients is doing a thousand boards, you know, like what is the replacement cost of something breaking down? And like, pro so if I'm doing a run of a thousand boards and I put the wrong firmware onto a thousand boards, how much does it cost to have someone open the case yeah. up, plug in a, you know, plug in a tag connector with whatever is equivalent, reprogram it, close it back up. Like that just like the cost of replacement or the opportunity cost of all these things is really high. And so Yes, it, you know the, the sticker price is high on these things, but it it saves so much money potentially. Yeah, I, I wish I could get a mailing list of all the people who've had to go back into a warehouse and reflash oh. firmware oh. or something. Yeah. Yeah, like, like a support group. <laughs> <laughs> be like, I have something that <laughs> you may be interested in. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, it may not be. I don't really know anything that's a direct competitor and you know obviously i'm i'm quite favorably inclined toward our products but i would just <laughs> you don't say, say. <laughs> uh i just say like uh you know ask your cm for a report on every unit and you know if there's any other way to do this i'd love to know about it but typically they'll give you a pretty pretty slick deflection or something like oh it's all in our you know erp system that's and right it's right very secure that's right very we, very secure we, we want to make sure we don't put this on the internet uh, <laughs> just to make sure that hackers you know hackers don't get to it <laughs> <laughs> but you know that doesn't seem like a big ask to just say like look i i'm, I'm gonna give you an order you're gonna make my stuff this is my business depends on this product and I just want to get a report on every unit. Can you make that happen for me? And I, I think they should be able to do that. And I don't know any other way to do it so far. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, one thing that Jan talked about when he was on the show was kind of like tying things all the way back. He was talking about it in a medical context, but, you know, just more broadly as well of tracking and troubleshooting from having data. You know, he, he talked about having data that's attached to each board. What about then... Is there something with the stickers that you might print out or the test reports or something like that where you'd be able to do a postmortem on something that's like out in the field then and be able to track it back and be like, oh, actually, it didn't pass a certain test? Or like, how, how does that data end up getting used aside from the business intelligence of we've got 99% yield, that sort of thing? You you can connect the dots with it. So uh, I guess the the a classic example would be you have a product with three circuit boards in it. And as each board at the board level, you uh, might scan a, a QR code on a bare board that identifies which bare board you're using. You populate it, build it, test it with um, an ICT fixture. It passes all the tests. You put a new label on it that identifies it as a PCBA. And then at the end of the line, you've got three different boards and you scan those three PCBA serial numbers, and that becomes part of the, the test report of that finished good. Mm. And that way, that seems like the cleanest way that you could have a test report that then says, all right, this unit is made up of this board and this board and this board, 
and here's the test report on those boards and then you know see did that did that board get tested three times in order to pass or did, was it a first time pass when was that when was it tested you know the timestamps are all part of the test reports the location mm-hmm. identity you can see which PLT was used. If there was ever a variation in PLTs, you could see which pogo pin cassette was used. If a cassette was wearing out and started to show failures, you could trace it back to that that uh, cassette as well. So it just ties things together. It doesn't necessarily tell you what's wrong, but it makes it a lot faster to get to the root cause or get meaningful data out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Those uh, test fixture wear out things. Those are fun. I remember my Samsung days, we used to do gauge R and R studies. We'd like compare like, Oh, actually no, that, that one like scanning electron microscope always is low. And like, you'd actually be able to like pull that out of the data, which is like, insane. But like, then you could start to say like, that's why, you know, obviously that you need, needed fixing or Cal or whatever, but you could actually verify that that's why these things are trending in the wrong direction. And I guess yeah. you could do the same kind of thing here if you wanted to kind of back calculate all those, all those things. Yeah. It just makes it easy to gather that that data. I think there's still a lot of a lot of work to do to process some of those things, and we're not really that far along on the analytics aspect of it. And mm-hmm. we we may we may never even get into that, but we will try to make it as easy as possible to gather good data and you know send it to the right place. Yeah. You know, one thing I also think about is, so you mentioned this example, I like this example with the three boards, you know, you say you have connectors in between or cabling or whatever it is. I always think about like cables and connectors as like abstraction interfaces, right? So like, yeah, the analog signal going from board one to board two is there or whatever, but there's also an I squared C and, you know, you don't, you, you don't know maybe if the functionality is the same, there's no way to actually test other than like, so if board one is supposed to talk to board two over I squared C or serial, and it's got some command it's supposed to throw down to it, but the firmware version is not right on board two. And it, it's just like, I don't know, I don't know what you're asking me for. There really wouldn't be any way to check that. It might look like a perfectly fine board, but there's no way to actually validate that until you plug them together. And then you just have this like random error. But it sounds like with the PLT and like these test reports, you actually could say, oh, actually, no, no, no. Board one had firmware version three, board two had version uh, version th- four and they, those don't talk to each other yet or something like that. Yeah. And it, it's increasingly common to have a product with multi, like a PLT itself has three versions of firmware on it or yeah, three, right, uh, right. instances like the UX is one piece of Zephyr. The motherboard's got a, another piece of Zephyr, oh, all Zephyr running huh? on nice, it. Yeah. And then, and then Linux, uh, is running on it too. So, mm-hmm. and, and we've had, projects where there might be uh, five or six different firmware images running on a single board and it's just a lot to keep track of. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, and I mean like, yeah, you could have all the API documentation in the world, but if you don't have the right firmware and the right checking at the beginning of like, oh, actually we don't we don't talk to each other yet. <laughs> I don't I don't have that language in my language, that sort of thing. Yeah. And and some people might be like, well, it's all over the air updates anyway, but it's like yeah, but it's got to get programmed once <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> like... <laughs> That's right. There's no bootloader for OTA yet. I mean, once that shows up, then <laughs> that'll be interesting. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's uh, that first time. That first time is pretty critical, huh? We think so. Yeah. 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 Well, what are some of the trends you're seeing? I mean, obviously, you you know you've you've mentioned already that you're seeing trends over time and how people are testing things. You had mentioned at the beginning, like. The moving from PLT 200 to 300, that there's more Linux out in the world. Where do you see the IoT industry or just more broadly like the embedded industry and where these this combination of hardware and firmware being put out into the world? What, what do you see next? Things are definitely going up market. So just Linux on, on smaller and smaller things. I think there will still be a separation though. There... there <laughs> I, I sort of feel like things under $100 are Zephyr land and, and should be not running Linux. It's just too, you know, if, if it's just a temperature sensor, like 
come on, let's not let's not get <laughs> yeah, carried right, away right, here. Right. We don't we don't need the graphics on that one, maybe you know, <laughs> or an air tag or something like that. Like there's there's gonna be a home for these for, for Zephyr essentially, mm. but anything above two hundred and fifty bucks ought to be running Linux. I mean, why not? It's it's there. <laughs> it does a lot. <laughs> you can run a spaceship with it. That's right. Yeah, you know, yeah. like it might as well or rovers be, or or you know, hel- Mars helicopter. We got a lot of choices now, yeah. Pete. You know, of all the space vehicles that that could be yeah. extraterrestrial vehicles, I suppose. So, if it's that expensive already, you know, it just seems like it should have that stable foundation and capable foundation. And then I just think it's kind of a no man's land, no man's land in between, like a hundred, like things just shouldn't be $180. Like, I just don't understand <laughs> what that, that shouldn't exist, <laughs> at least in Got electronics. It. Oh, interesting. Interesting. <laughs> so, so like someone shows up, they're like, Pete, I'd like you to, to uh, you know, build this product for me. You're like, how much is it going to cost? Oh, 150. Nah, nah no. See you later. <laughs> Does it, shouldn't exist. <laughs> Sorry. I don't, I don't believe in your product. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I also just really hope we're heading toward a future where just devices are better and that they're like longer warranties, more of a support system behind them, and that there's just more. There, there are fewer devices, but better devices, and you know they're more capable, but they also last longer. And you're saying this as a hardware manufacturer, folks. So that's uh, that's something. <laughs> He's like, I hope there's less things to build. <laughs> yeah, luck- luckily we don't have a lot of shareholders. To- <laughs> they, I, I would have been booted by now if we, no, if we were right. a public company. So, so, so he's saying what? <laughs> <laughs> no growth. No growth. Actually, well, this does change. This is an interesting thing. So, so you, recently, uh, Blue Clover has been taking more of a, a new tack on on like focus and, and things like that. Could you explain? Explain what that is, in terms of like the impact and stuff. Yeah, I get, with with COVID, it, it was definitely an opportunity for retrospection, and uh, we we just decided to double down on the environment. And I guess the easiest way to describe it would be we we just aim to be the Patagonia of electronics and really advocate for design decisions that benefit the environment and. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's hard to do because there's so there's so much business pressure, but it there's a big societal payoff if we think about those end of life situations and conditions and uh, try to adopt more beneficial features like recyclability, repairability, yep. durability, and and that kind of stuff and. There are a yep. lot of people that care about it, and there just hasn't been there hasn't been that leadership in electronics that we we could really find Apple somewhat, but you know it's it's kind of a different species. <laughs> the best they're doing is 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 make is making the iPhone look the exact same every single year, even if they're not the exact same. <laughs> yeah, I mean they. We we wa- we've been around a while, and definitely the quality of electronics has improved a lot. And I, I mm-hmm. give Apple a lot of credit for that. Mm. I, I I think they're so powerful now. There's always more they could do, but you know it's also just hard to compare ourselves to the. I mean, they're just so yeah. gigantic that yeah. I can't. I mean, I actually get tired of a client coming to me and saying, I want to do this because Apple did it. It's like, yeah, but that's, yeah. Uh, that's right. That's right. <laughs> I can't that's, do that for that's you. That's <laughs> the largest company in the world. So yeah, I can't build you an iPhone for $600 or, or even $1,200 or whatever, whatever their selling price is. I can't make that at cost. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there needs to be somebody else that, that, that can gather, electronics companies and say, well, how, what can we do? What can we do actually? And we're, we're doing that with not even electronics companies, but, uh, we're working with folks in the climate neutral community, like, uh, peak design, they make camera bags and nomad goods. They do make electronics. They make other things as well. Voy and line dock are all companies that, we just had a meeting this week to talk about recycled aluminum. So we're all making oh, cool. stuff in China. 
we're all using some aluminum, not a lot, not as much as Apple, but we want to use a, we want to use recycled aluminum. And we talk, we all talk to our suppliers and they're all like, nope, we're not, we're not going to do it. And we're like, well, why not? And we're like, reasons. And we're like, what reasons? And, you know, we're just yeah. trying to it's gather together. New conversations, and, it sounds like, 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 why would yeah. you even bother to do that when there's all this perfectly good brand new aluminum that came from the, you know, the smelter or whatever. So, right, yeah. right. So just uh, uh, bringing people together to have those kinds of conversations and figure mm. out achievable goals toward, uh, yeah. you know, more, more eco stuff. Yeah, no, I think it's, it's tough because, because of the financial focus, right? I mean, because of the end result of the almighty dollar. Like I think any of these things are possible, right? Like to make something that's super repairable or to make something that's super recyclable or, you know, using, using recycled materials, but there's, especially at the beginning, there's always cost involved and there's no, there's no external forces aside from like goodwill right now. And so you're talking about the goodwill, it sounds like, which is awesome. And then if these companies also have client bases that are also for that, it's like, that's a really good first step, I think, because I think that it's totally possible to make things that are of equivalent equivalent quality it's just a matter of you know finding finding these new methodologies that do that sort of thing yeah and other industries have proven they can build a market for it Mm. like you look at food you look at apparel those are two examples where they talk about how they source their ingredients or their materials and People seem to resonate with that the work that they're doing, and they're like, "Yeah, I'm I'm eating that. If I'm going to put that in my body, you know, I want to know it's it's clean, it's grown in a sustainable way." And so, electronics doesn't fit that exact. You know, it's not the same thing. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. Well, you say like, except for the body modders, many people are not putting things electronics in their body. But uh, <laughs> but yeah. But at least you're you're kind of voting with your wallet a That's bit right. when yeah. you when you do that, and so we're luckily in a position where we're selling a higher end. You know, we're not mm-hmm. selling a ten dollar product, so we and, and and we don't have we don't have a direct comp competitor that we gotta like try to undercut on price yet. So uh, it just seemed like an opportunity for us to say, well, how, let's make sure we're making this in a way that you know, we feel good about and that we, we, we can achieve some environmental goals at the same time that we're doing our business. Yeah. That's really great. That's really great. Well, cool. Pete, anything else people should know about Blue Clover or, you know, getting started, sending business your way, uh, buying PLTs, where should people find out more? At our website. So bcdevices.com and you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Pete at Pete Staples but mostly it's just photos of bike lanes. So uh, don't, <laughs> why, don't get your why hopes is up. That? <laughs> <laughs> uh, just sometimes I'm on my bike and I'm like, oh, cool new bike lane and take a picture <laughs> and I don't know what to do with it. So I just put it on Twitter. <laughs> that sounds right. Yeah. It's how the internet formed, folks. You know, it was just cats <laughs> to start with. Pete's just into bike lanes, you know. And actually, as a re- reward for staying with us this long into the podcast, uh, if you if you're in the U.S. and you want a free USB C cable, you can email me at pete at bcdevices dot com. Just send me your address, and we'll send you a cable. Nice. All right. That's great. Cool. Well, thanks, Pete, for telling us about all this stuff. I, I, I'm excited about this. You know, I'm getting into more of the, the firmware and the deployment side of things, and these kind of software enablements are are quite useful and might make me look better to clients. So I really appreciate that sort of thing. And you know, all all these tools are letting people make better products, which is going to have lots of benefits, like you explained. Yeah, happy to chat more about that and. Glad to see what you're doing with the ABC board. That's that's a really cool product. And also thanks for creating contextual electronics. Actually, one of our account managers is in your class. So, oh, awesome. Uh, he's, awesome. he's learning a lot of cool new stuff and sending me pull requests on sales material and stuff <laughs> like that. I'm like, oh, but usually sales teams don't do that's CICD, right. but okay, cool. All right. All right. That's great. <laughs> So thanks for doing that. Yeah, thanks again, Pete. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Cheers, Chris. Bye.